Greetings, imagine. The Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies. Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and of course, the always yet undefined <laughs> existential Mr. Rogers. I guess that would be right for this episode. Me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am, of course... Rob casting at you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity. This is Rob Observations, episode number 880. Are you all buzzing from Ahsoka? Have you all seen it? Y'all, were you all there, right there, you know, getting in? I have yet to watch it. I was going to watch it after this show so I can talk about it on the John Campia podcast tomorrow. I did not see it. I hope you all enjoyed it. So. You know, it's tough during these times of strike. I mean, what kind of, uh, how do I opine on various aspects of the entertainment industry that's shut down? But there's always something. You know me, I like, uh, I like digging around. I, lo I like looking up articles. By the way, um, somebody posted a comment on the Otoy episode of Rob's Evasions that I did about Otoy's shorts, Star Trek shorts, where Spock's in his motion picture garb and the Otoy uh, guys recreated Yeoman Colt and did all that. And somebody complained, I guess it was a complaint, maybe it was a complaint to take down, I don't know. They didn't like the fact that I read articles. They're like, I'm not in elementary school. And I, you know, when, when people do that, a valid criticism. You know, I all criticism, if you put yourself out there, you have to accept the criticism that you receive. And uh, as all smart people do, uh, when you make something that is for public consumption and you get critiqued back or you might get vehement hatred you never you you never go to bat you never confront your hatred or your haters directly that is a losing battle that you cannot win and they love to get your goat your work should speak and stand for itself as much as you might want to combat the people that are criticizing you um i however have a standing, as everyone knows. If somebody wants to take me to task or doesn't like what I've said or if I've criticized your work, this show, Rob's Evasions, there is a standing offer to anyone who vehemently dislikes me, doesn't like my opinions, would like to rebut anything I say. That's why you can send me letters, but I'll put you on the show. You know, if you really want to take me to task, come on the show. Let's have a discussion. That's that's the very basis of what this show is about. And I mean that if you're an industry professional or I mean, look, I'm not going to let just anybody come on. You have to have a you have to give me your reasoned argument and show me that you can actually speak in this milieu because a lot of people can't. But I do leave it open. But anyway, someone took me to task for reading articles. And I'm like, look, I find articles because one, you guys haven't read them. Maybe some of you have, but for the most part, you haven't. And I believe that they offer uh, a context. And I also, I always credit the writer. I explain where it came from. And I don't ever share things that are uh, behind a paywall. So, 
you know, some people can say, well, you're monetizing other people's work. Well, I mean, if it's an article that was written as I'm about to read uh, seven years ago on a blog or something, um, I'm sure the author, when I say their name, is happy to have me bring back their work and point people in the direction of where they can find more. Although that might be wrong. And if, if it's wrong, write me a letter. You can find me at postgeeksingularity.com. So let me, let me give you the, the thought process that I had um, about why I wanted to do this show. And first, I have to give a shout out to my good friend, Zach Stentz, um, who wrote him and Ashley Edward Miller, wrote Agent Cody Banks. I was instrumental in getting them that job, me and Carrie David, writing that film. They also wrote uh, X-Men First Class and Thor. They wrote two novels together. They've done a lot of stuff together. I worked for Ashley uh, Miller on um, on uh, uh, Dota Dragon's Blood. As an, I was the animatic editor for three seasons of that show that you can watch on Netflix. I know everyone talks about Arcane, but hey, if you like anime and you like sword and sorcery and fantasy adventure and all your favorite horror stars doing the voice of dragons, tune in to Dota Dragon's Blood and watch and see my name in the end credits. But so... Zach, um, Zach, I've known him for 25 years. He was one of my first proponents of my work after seeing Free Enterprise. He used to write for uh, Entertainment Weekly. He's an incredibly talented guy, very, very smart. And I follow him on social media. And he always posts some really interesting things. And he posted something yesterday, um, a, th a thread on Twitter that I thought was fantastic. And it was about Jaws. I know, right? I saw Jaws in the theater. My parents wouldn't let me go when it first came out. I did see it in 1975 when it came out. I was eight years old. Actually, I probably wasn't eight yet. I was probably seven when I saw it. But I, I went, uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, I know I was seven because my friend Jeff Swafford, it was his birthday and his birthday is in February. So uh, that's when he went. We went for his birthday. That's when I got to see Jaws. I didn't get to see it in the summer. I had to wait. It was still playing. Saw it at the Coliseum Theater that's no longer there in downtown Seattle. But anyway, I've seen Jaws, as I'm sure all of you who are watching this show right now, you can probably recite half of Jaws. You probably know the shots. It's one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, I've seen it probably a hundred times. Uh, I've owned it on every home video format, you know. Laserdisc, VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, 4K. You know, I've got them all. Seen seen every version. The Laserdisc, that box set was amazing. Well, anyway, so Zach yesterday tweeted out a thread from David Hines. And um, you know what? I really, I thought I'd, I thought I'd prepped for the show. But just so before I... Um, before I actually uh, bogart Mr. Hines thread, um, I would really like to show you guys, well, I, I guess um, for whatever reason, I, uh, I can get it right now. I forgot to uh, put the graphic in so you can all follow him because I, I you know, credit's important. You gotta, you gotta give people credit where credit is due. I think that's only fair. Um, so anyway, hang on, let me turn this off and Anyway, I'll, I'll show that in a minute. I'll, we'll, we'll follow up with that. So David Hines wrote a Twitter thread about Jaws. And what prompted him to do it was he finally went back and read Peter Benchley's novel. Now, I've read Peter Benchley's novel. I read it probably soon after I saw the film. So I was probably in the fourth, fifth, or sixth grade when I read the novel Jaws. And the novel is significantly different from the movie. I would dare say that it's a movie, it's one of those movies that I think, like Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, I would say Jaws is probably better than the book. But anyway, be that as it may, we're going to get into it. So David Hines wrote this. This is his Twitter thread, and I'll share it with you. Uh, by the way, he's at H. R-A-D-Z-K-A, -A, at small H-R-A-D-Z-K-A. -A. That's where you can find him. So David Hines says, My brain has needed a break lately, so my bedtime reading book of the last couple of nights was Peter Benchley's Jaws. 
and it made me realize some new things about movie adaptations of books. I better understand Peter Benchley's grumbles about the changes in the movie and why they were made. There are some famous changes made from book to screen in Jaws, but the root of them is a change nobody talks about. Genre. Probably because Jaws, the novel, is a genre that really doesn't exist anymore. I'm not sure it was ever even named, but I call it the Way It Works novel. The Way It Works novel is best understood as a forerunner of the techno thriller. A techno thriller, type specimen, The Hunt for Red October, explains the ins and outs of a world unfamiliar to the reader and sense, sets an adventure there. The Way It Works explains the familiar. The Way It Works was a big genre in the 1970s. The type specimen <coughs> is Arthur Haley's 1968 novel, Airport. Everyone goes to airports, but lots of people don't think much about them. Airport explains in great detail how a modern airport works and then puts that system under pressure. Jaws, the novel, is a way it works about summer communities. And so the character conflicts are set up to dramatize the clash between summer and winter people. This is the rationale for the most notorious subplot jettisoned by the film, Matt Hooper's affair with Ellen Brody. In the novel, Ellen Brody was a well-off summer person who married a lower middle-class Amity native and has struggled to fit in into a winter person world. She keeps trying to socialize with summer people. Matt Hooper, a rich kid from the world she left, is summer people. In the novel, Ellen also has a family history with Hooper. She coincidentally dated his 10 years older brother. That world is behind her now. Benchley focuses a lot on her having to leave uh, to live cheap or to leave cheap. The Brody dinner menus are determined by the recurring supermarket specials. The discerning reader or viewer will have instantly realized a key difference from book to film. In the film, Martin and Ellen Brody are transplants who moved from New York. The summer person, winter person, social scene conflict a big motivator for Ellen, is barely mentioned. I think there are three big reasons for this change. One, there's not enough running time to dramatize the summer-winter issue, so it would feel rushed. Two, it distracts from the main plot line. It'd make the audience dislike Hooper. And three, it undermines the dynamic of the second half of the film. If Brody is an island lifer, and so is Quint, then they've got too much in common against Hooper, especially if Hooper is also sleeping with Brody's wife. It's unbalanced. Not Brody, Hooper, and Quint, but Quint and Brody against Hooper. In the film, you can stack any two of the three men on the Orca into a group that gives them something in common against the third. Society member, Brody and Hooper, versus loner, Quint. Older, Brody and Quint versus Younger, Hooper, Nautical, Quint and Hooper versus Landlubber, Brody. In the film, all of the character differences are carefully augmented in a way that facilitates the characters being able to play off each other in a broad variety of ways. In the book, Brody and Quint have more in common. The other thing that the film changes notably from the book is something that I've talked about before with regard to film and magic tricks. The way to build an effect is to make it get bigger or more intense as it goes along. And then this was from a tweet he had back on April 14th. So he, he's flashbacking to his own Twitter feed in this thread. So David Hines says, The magic-related trick related to the power loader setup and payoff in Aliens. The emotional pacing and effect on the audience comes from the fact that it gets bigger as it goes along. Screenwriters, storytellers take note. First, the conversational mention of the power loader. Second, we see it in casual use as it was intended. And the third, Ripley wears it in a fight to the death with the alien queen. As Mew Zack has noted that Zack Stentz, Jaws is really two stories, one following the other, 
Number one, a shark hunts people near the beach. And then two, people hunt a shark in the ocean. The film brilliantly builds the intensity as it goes along. This is another area changes were made. Thinking about Jaws the film, what's the most intense part of part one? The shark attacks on the beachgoers? Right, the 4th of July. You have that huge tension buildup, the fake shark fin scare by the prankster kids, and then the real shark goes after the kids in the safe kitty zone. In Jaws the novel, the most intense shark attack comes earlier. As in the film, the first young woman is killed swimming at night, Then, after the beaches aren't closed, the kid on the raft gets eaten. The big difference? Not long after the kid gets eaten, an older man is attacked and killed on the same day. By contrast, the 4th of July scare in the book is minor. A kid dared go for a swim for 10 bucks, narrowly escapes the shark when Hooper spots it. Hooper also turns up earlier in the book. He doesn't go diving in Bed Gardner's boat and drop the tooth. Brody and one of his men lean over to recover the tooth, don't lose it, and Hooper goes, yep, that's a great white. The film sticks to the basic outlines of Benchley's story, but rearranges a lot and jettisons other things, constantly asking two questions. How can we get character conflict here? And two, how can we make sure intensity is always building? Example, the summer people, winter people stuff requires a lot of pipe be laid, so to speak. How do you bring some of that conflict in without needing all that groundwork? Answer, make Martin Brody the opposite of an island person. In the novel, Brody is a guy who has a lot of friends, a lot of deep ties, who's part of the mover and shaker scene, but not a kingpin. In the film, he's more shallowly rooted, more politically vulnerable, has an intrinsically different perspective than the mayor. So how do you build intensity? Make the shark attacks bigger as they go. The main problem, bigger. Make the 4th of July attack the biggest attack and then get off the beach because nobody in their right mind would go in the water after that. You have to go to sea. Once on the orca, you're in a more intense situation. But you can start with small scares again because it's a new situation. So now you move the smaller scares on the orca up. This famous jump scare, that's when he's chumming the water and the shark comes up and he backs up into Quint's cabin and says, you're going to need a bigger boat. The famous jump scare happens later in the book after way scarier stuff. Going back to the first half of the film, another way to escalate the situation is to introduce new characters and give them stuff to do with characters you already know. In the book, Hooper shows up early on before Alex Kittner's death, consulting but doesn't do much. In the film, Hooper shows up after Alex Kintner's death, escalates the situation, the problem isn't solved, and immediately starts doing things with Brody, the shark, the shark dissection, followed by discovering Ben Gardner's boat. The Ben Gardner's boat scare is escalated by A, having Hooper in the water, B, jump scare, and C, Hooper drops the tooth. So now it's not just that the mayor disagrees about what to do, the mayor doesn't believe them because they have no evidence. Jaws was famously a nightmare to make and to adapt. Carl Gottlieb, John Milius, Robert Shaw, and others all took turns on all or part of the script, but it's a great adaptation and it's well worth studying why the changes were made and most importantly worked. A lot of it comes down to character dynamics. How can we maximize the ways his character can bounce off other characters given his part and their parts of the story and audience management? How can we keep the audience experience building? For Peter Benchley, who had really tried to get at something about the weird dynamics of summer towns, not just their economics, but their social environment, it felt like the film lost a lot of what he wanted to say about the kind of places he was writing about. I still prefer the film to the book, but now I understand much better where Peter Benchley was coming from. Again, that was on Twitter, or pardon me, on X. That was from David Hines at H-R-A-D-Z-K-A. And he published that two days ago. Now, you're all probably watching this going, what What the fuck are you talking about? What does this matter? I'll tell you what it matters. For me personally, I've seen Jaws a hundred times. I already love it. 
you know, I can tell you why I love it. I could probably write a long monograph or a PhD about why Jaws is one of the most important movies ever made. But you know what? When I read this thread, and I'm now a middle-aged man with one foot in the grave, and I saw this movie for the first time when I was seven years old in the Coliseum Theater, I still learned something new from Mr. Hines' analysis on X. I never thought that there was anything more to know about Jaws. But by reading this Twitter thread, I thought about the difference between summer people and winter people and how he so eloquently and simply shows the different character dynamics and the changes that were made from book to screen and why it works better on screen. I, by reading a simple Twitter thread that I wasn't expecting to read, kind of came out of nowhere that a friend of mine shared, gave me a better appreciation for a movie I already thought I appreciated enough. But what I just read to you, you can go find it yourself too if you want to read it again. Um, it made me appreciate the movie even more. But here's the thing. I, even though I did read the novel, never made the connection between summer people and winter people. I got it from the water. I mean, that whole thing, that whole element, because obviously the, the whole idea of what a summer community is, Amity means friendship, is a big part of the movie, but they don't lean into it. It's not much, I mean, you know that Martin is a landlubber, and that plays into the whole conflict at the end, but... David Hines very simply distilled all that, so I felt by reading this Twitter thread that I learned something about Jaws that I really had never considered before. And that was what? I once heard somebody say that you should never think that you know everything about something, because if you think that, you stop thinking about it, which got me thinking. One of the things that annoys the fuck out of me in our community of movie punditry or fans or you know we're always talking about what we like and what we don't like and the thing that i hear the most that drives me it drives me and makes me want to drink uh not alcohol of course now it's just water it drives me to drink is when people say well rob you know you understand that all art is subjective i hate it when people say that john campy and i I've had this disagreement for eight years. He thinks art's subjective, and I always go, wait, 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 hang on. And then he brings up very good points, like, okay, how do you know, how do you measure something like that? And of course, he's got a point there, how do you measure it? How do you measure objectivity and subjectivity? I'm willing to concede that every single person's view of art, what they think about art, is subjective to them. Now, whether or not they can recognize the objectivity of greatness in art, their subjective viewpoint might not allow them to understand that or might not allow them to see it. Now, people can say, well, how do you quantify that, Rob? You know, we can't measure it. Like, there's a lot of schools of thought that can say, well, you shouldn't really know, like I just said, anything because then you stop thinking about it. But there are things... I'm willing to concede that the way our current understanding of the universe, which could change, to be honest, um, the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, seems to be a relatively universal constant. Uh, the heat of the sun it might fluctuate, but we kind of know what it is. That's an objective truth. I mean, if you want to get into you know, the ontological, the teleological, or the cosmological arguments for and against the existence of God and all that basic philosophy, I know we could be here all day. But like if, if I were to pick something up and drop it on the ground, you could measure the speed based on the gravity that is we kind of understand. I mean, we don't know everything, but there are universal constants that we understand now with the science we have available to us. And I'm willing to concede because I'm going to get into a bit of metaphysics here. When it comes to art, we can't measure the objective greatness of art. But there are indicators that show it's there. Now, one of those first indicators is, I would say, just keep it simple. The AFI list of 100 great movies. Now, sure, those titles change, but a lot of them have stayed the same over the years. Critical consensus, um, time, history has said that 
these particular movies are standouts. They continue to be standouts decade after decade whenever they vote on them again. You know, sometimes you'll have Vertigo will be above Citizen Kane or that French chick about, you know, that movie about the French the French woman, the, the lady of the evening and her mundane life, whatever. Jean, I forget the name of it, but, you know, that one's now at the top of the list, whatever. I think that's, that's not necessarily a valid... Uh, I have to accept it because it's up on the top of the list now. But movies, books, plays, Shakespeare, history has a bit to play in the idea of the objectivity of art. The Mona Lisa, you know. I mean, you might... She might not be to your taste. You know, you might say, what's the big deal? And when you finally see the painting as I did, hanging in the Louvre, I was like, that's... A, you know, when you look at books... In college, I've, I've always been struck by sometimes how small paintings actually are because in my mind, they're all giant frescoes. <laughs> you see sometimes, hey, I thought pictures of melting watches would be huge. Well, when you see them, they're not. And But anyway, that doesn't make them less good. But um, I think while there's no real demonstrable way to measure the objective greatness of certain kinds of art, I would say it all comes back to consciousness and things we don't even understand about ourselves. But we do know that they are there. And when it comes right down to it, and I'll throw it out there because I just watched Interstellar uh, over the weekend, threw it on, I don't know why, I was just going through some 4Ks, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to watch Interstellar. And then I watched uh, Inception yet again. And every time I watch that movie, I have new questions. But the idea that love, you know, how do you prove love? What is the measurable? I guess you could could record brainwave patterns or figure it out. But we would all agree that love exists, right? So I'm going to go on a limb and say the objectivity in art exists. Now, I just want to start, as you might know, I found a few things I'd like to read. Uh, A cursory glance of the, the internet. Um, gave you these things. And the first thing I want to read uh, is from The Artifice, uh, the-artifice.com. And this was written by The Raptor Fence, The Raptor Fence, which is pretty funny. Uh, And this was published on March 8th, 2016. The Raptor Fence is a philosophy graduate from California with a love of the arts, cycling, and kittens. Oh, and he's deathly afraid of velociraptors, hence the raptor fence. So I'm going to go to uh, this article that uh, he published on theartifice.com. And so here we go. So, hey, if you're going to feel like you're in elementary school because I'm reading to you, so be it. And the title of this is, That's Just Like Your Opinion, Man, An Argument That Art Is objective. Art is objective. Keep calm, art majors. Your postmodern art is not wasted effort. Hopefully not, anyways. It's a well-understood fact that art has a degree of subjectivity to it. That is, not everyone will agree on what is and what is not art. In fact, arguing about what is and what is not art has become a cultural pastime for first world countries. This site is a testament to that fact, with article titles such as Silent Hill 2, A Pinnacle in Gaming Symbolism, and The Rise and Fall of M. Night Shyamalan. Assertions made that there really is a pinnacle to making gaming symbolism or that filmmaker M. Night Shyamalan has fallen from a previous high point. These factual suggestions are incongruous to the cultural acceptance that art is entirely subjective. That is, art is whatever the audience wants it to be. In a more academic sense, subjectivity in art means that anything can be art, regardless of any sort of criteria. A pen laying on a card table without author or audience would be art. A lamppost on the side of the road engineered for an entirely different purpose beyond the artistic would be art. And of course, an art piece hanging in a museum would be art, and its purpose would be entirely subjective to the audience. The issue with this belief is already evident. Though culturally the belief is that art is fully subjective, in the same breath people make objective claims, opinions, and statements about art. 
These claims underlie a set of objective criteria that society and logic dictate must exist in order to argue about art in this first place. And if these criteria do indeed exist, then art would have to be objective. Understand this doesn't mean that art cannot have a degree of subjectivity to it. The difference between each human in terms of experiences, intelligence, and physical form would causally link to subjective opinions of art. Look, I felt that, I mean, your educational level, your life experience, how many girls or boys you've kissed in your lifetime, what kind of experiences you've had there, your familial experiences, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, whatever, who you are as a human being will subjectively or, or make your subjective view of art different from the next person. Your opinion of art is absolutely subjective, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can recognize the objective greatness in art. It's there. You just might not be able to see it. And that's not a bad thing. Just like I never thought about winter and summer people in Jaws ever until I read a Twitter thread on August 20th, 2023 from David Hines, which was a repost from screenwriter Zach Stentz. Anyway, Understand this doesn't mean that art cannot have a degree of subjectivity to it. The difference between each human in terms of experiences, intelligence, and physical form would causally link to subjective opinions of art. But what makes those opinions valid? Ah, there's the rub. Why listen to a critic deride a video game if his opinion has no objective base to work from? Why call your favorite film your favorite if it's no less favorable than anybody else's. Certainly, there must exist some objective criteria upon which people can refer to art. Of course, already the word art conjures up a range of human memories and emotions, suggesting that the brain is already attempting to make a connection of properties of art to an actual definition of the word, because the word art is going to be thrown around a lot in this article, there should be some distinctions as to what that word means. Art can refer to the medium upon which the art pieces are produced. It can also refer to the piece itself. Often it refers to something beyond the art piece, a certain movement upon which human consciousness, intellect, or emotion finds something stimulated, stimulating in an incomprehensible way. It can also refer to the art piece after that feeling, as a distinction from other art pieces that did not give them that feeling. Finally, it can refer back to that feeling given by a particular piece of art, an echo of the original feeling that is entirely different, but perhaps doesn't feel as stimulating or is as comprehensible enough that it can be worked through. Let's create these as formal definitions. Art form, the medium upon which art pieces are produced. Art piece, the piece itself, sublime, the incomprehensible stimulation of particular art pieces, art work, art pieces that evoke the sublime, and artistic, that echo of the sublime which does not reach the same feeling of sublime, but rather mimics it. Let's apply these definitions to an example. John watches the art piece No Country for Old Men which was created using the art form of film. As he is watching, he finds himself simultaneously terrified and humored by the antics of Anton Chigurh, Javier Bardem, in a way that he cannot fully explain. This experience that he has is the sublime. From then on, he tells people that No Country for Old Men is an artwork because he experienced the sublime. However, his friends Dan and Lucy do not believe No Country for Old Men is an artwork, but instead is simply an art piece. Dan does not comprehend the plot of the film, which he finds too complicated for his tastes, and Lucy does comprehend the plot of the film, but fully comprehends Anton Chigurh's antics and her emotions regarding the situation, and she does not experience the sublime. 
While those antics remind her of a past movie that did create the sublime for her, the film Fargo. They do not fully reach the same level of Fargo, and she remains confident that Fargo is an artwork, while No Country for Old Men is simply artistic. Notice a few details in this example. Dan, Lucy, and John all disagree on whether No Country for Old Men is an artwork. However, all of them agree that it is an art piece. This is because the definitions of art forms and art pieces are not subjective to the audience, but exist in logical terms and are thus objective. However, the terms artwork and artistic also rely on the subjective experience of the sublime. Thus, artwork and artistic are always subjective to the audience. One of the objective criteria as to what makes art is that all art requires an artist, an art piece, and an audience. You know, I've often said this when people would tell me that they want to be a writer, and I would ask them, well, do you write anything? And, well, I just write my diary. I just write for myself. You know, that's all I write for. And I would always think to myself, I'm like, okay, but whether you're writing for yourself or an audience, if you put pen to paper or you clatter your fingers across a keyboard and write in Microsoft Word or another software, the act of writing presupposes the idea that somebody's going to read it. And maybe that reader is only you, the writer. But someone's going to read it. Otherwise, why write? So if you want to be a writer and you start writing, you've become a writer. But the reason you're doing it is because you want somebody to either read what you've written or know that you've written it either way it's an audience and even if that audience is only you the act of writing presupposes an audience just like the act of making a film also presupposes an audience why would anybody make a movie if they didn't think anyone was going to watch it even if it was just to show it to your friends the 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 art of storytelling and the art of movie making presupposes an audience whether you want to admit it or not it does otherwise why do it so the artist makes the art piece which is then experienced by the audience these three entities could all share in the same object for example the artist could be the piece or the audience as well performance art art, performance art such as marina abramovic's Rhythm 2, or Vito uh, Asconci's Seed Bed would be examples of this, because the artist will always be a part of the audience as they are simultaneously experiencing and creating during their art, there can be no audience. An art piece must exist, though it may in fact be nothing at all, thus imparting the piece back onto the artist or audience, such as the case of Andy Warhol's Invisible Art Exhibition, Examine the relationship between art pieces and audience by leaving canvases blank and sculpture stands untouched. What is most important here, however, is that no art piece can be created ex nihilo. Nihilo. Nihilo? 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 An artist, I've never seen that word before, ex nihilo? An artist must create the art piece. If there is no artist, it cannot be art even if it evokes the sublime. A person may marvel at an alpine mountain's majesty and find it sublime, but without a creator, it does not make the mountain art. The importance of an artist's relationship to their art piece comes from their intention. Why is the artist making the art? There are plenty of art pieces that have been made for the sake of their own existence. In fact, the entire catalog of kitsch art could be claimed as art that has been made solely to perpetuate existence. Kitsch art is what is made to decorate or ornate and has no real value beyond its own existence. Think of paintings of kittens in baskets or of a velvet Elvis. These objects exist purely for their own sake. People decorate with them because of attached sentimental value, but they have no meaning beyond what the audience has prescribed it. 
This is important. It means the artist must have the intention behind his or her creation apart from that which the audience gives it. In other words, the art piece must have means other than its own end in order to become an artwork. For example, a doodle absent-mindedly drawn on the back of a notepad exists as an art piece, but its absent-minded nature means it lacks the ability to become an artwork. However, if during the process of doodling, the artist suddenly became aware of the doodle and began to draw with earnest, then it has the ability to become an artwork. This declaration points to the heart of the purpose of all art, to create a lasting impression. Whatever else art does, it starts with evoking something within a person. That something can be an almost infinite combination of different emotions, intellectual stimulations, memories, experiences, and more, but it still requires the creation of impressions. Above all, art is intentional and relational. Now, if I can jump out of this article for a minute, I'm going to get back to it. I would say this. Our understanding, science's understanding, the human understanding of consciousness and even being alive is nebulous at best. We don't really fully understand what it means to exist in the universe. Um, one of my favorite, I guess he's a physicist, and uh, he, uh, Brian Cox, the soft-spoken British man who used to be a new wave pop star. Um, I love listening to him, but there is a thought that consciousness, that higher levels of consciousness such as ourselves, that our purpose in the universe is to acknowledge its existence. The idea that humanity or any higher being, any intelligence, uh, whether it's rare or not, if we find out that intelligence is incredibly rare, we're humanity is right now, all we know, we're the only beings in the universe, or at least in the Milky Way galaxy, as far as we know, that can reflect on the existence of the universe. And since what we're made up of is star stuff, if you're a Carl Sagan fan, it's kind of interesting that we exist at all. How did it happen? But our uh, awareness of existence, human, we, we, there's, we breathe air. So we all know what it's like to have air coming in and filling our lungs. You know, we have to eat. We have to defecate. You know, we sweat. We, we, there are universal truths about human existence that all of us share. So art, then, if it is imbued with truth, call it what you want, but if it touches upon the truths of our existence in a certain way. Now, again, we can't measure this, but I think one day we will. I think that people will be hooked up with some kind of machines, whether it's the squid system from Strange Days or the brainstorm device or whatever it is, we will actually be able to measure and quantify how art responds or how it triggers our consciousness, our brain, whatever. Right now, we can't measure it. I believe that someday we will be able to measure it. You know, we will be able to see that in a, in a movie that people have a certain reaction at this point. There's an actual, like when you cry in a film, how does that happen? And if lots of people cry at the same time, that film, because of the way it's structured and acted, all of it, I mean, you'd need a three-dimensionally deep learning AI to figure this out, but eventually it will be quantified. And people will figure out, well, I cried in the movie because of this. We'll be able to show that most human beings, and again, you have to have a certain level of intellect to have it work. Objectively, the film works, and we don't, even the filmmakers don't know why it works as well as it does up to this point. But eventually, we'll be able to map it in the brain. And, and for the most part, not everyone's going to have the same response because there's going to be some people that grow up in an entirely different environment and they won't even know what they're looking at, much less understand why you needed papers in Casablanca during World War II. You know, they were not going to know. But if you know, people are going to have a similar response where then you can point at Casablanca and go, based on our scientific studies and what we've done 
in the scans of 3,000 brains or whatever, we now know that Casablanca, and by the way, for all of the reasons that the movie comes together, not just Michael Curtiz's direction or Humphrey Bogart or or Peter Lorre or Ingrid Bergman or for whatever, whatever, whatever reasons, all of those things, and that'll be even more infinitely more difficult to quantify and actually be measurable, but eventually it will be measurable. We'll be able to know that a movie like Casablanca is objectively great. We just don't have the tools to measure that yet. So all we can go on is our consciousness and, and history. I think history, the fact that certain stories resonate with humanity decade after decade, century after century, might, might tell you that there is objectively something going on in these stories that allow them to transcend time. Now look, I understand this is really hippy-dippy. I get it. Well, Rob, we don't have... I mean, it's all subjective. Here's the thing. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different experience of the world and all that. But... but, And, and everyone wants to believe that their opinions are the most valid things in the world. And they are for you. Whatever your opin- opinions are, they're valid for you. I'm never going to come along and tell you like, if you tell me that you love Strange New Worlds, I'd be like, great, fantastic, you should love it. If you love Strange New Worlds, I do not. And and I can explain to you, I try and look at things, and it's funny because people like, whenever I read the comments on these chats, there's some people that don't know me that are new to the chat, and by the way, welcome, and we're going to have a member call this weekend if you're a member of the channel, and by the way, if you want to... Uh, you can leave a tip below and put a question. Some people leave tips and they don't leave questions. I'm like, well, I really appreciate you support the channel, but I'd love to hear what you say. So super chats and tips, give me your best. If you want, if you think I'm full of shit right now, I want to hear from you. You get your day in the sun. You get a full shake here. Everybody's welcome. Even if you hate my guts and think I'm a douche. Um, the point here is discussion. So there's going to be people like if you're going to watch something, a a movie that was about a subject matter that you knew nothing about. Nothing about, but if it was objectively a great movie, even though you knew nothing about it, dollars to donuts that you'd be able to see something in it of value and you might be stirred to emotion. And if a movie, if a story that's unfolding, that every single element of that story is contrived. When you're making a movie... Every camera angle, every location. I mean, I'm not talking about the fact that even when you're shooting something like Terrence Malick shooting Days of Heaven, which, by the way, coming out in 4K from Criterion, woo-hoo, all of it's, everything is fabricated, and it's designed to create, and sometimes it works better than others. And, and again, how do you measure that? Don't know. Eventually, I think, I believe that we will be able to, because we'll be able to plug into the old noggin and we can see how these things react on people's brains. And we'll have enough data. We just don't have it yet. But I do believe that the objectivity of art will eventually be quantifiable. Because if it's not quantifiable, you can't actually make the assertion that art is objectively good. I believe it is. That is a, that is a theory, which unfortunately I cannot test right now because there's nothing measurable... I, you know, I can get a cross-section of things that people like, but I, it's, it, I, can't, I can't prove that it is. So, anyway, let me continue on with this, with this article. Because here's the crux. So now that art forms and art pieces have been objectively defined, what about art works? Can art works be objectively defined? Well, as stated earlier, the sublime is experiential. It occurs different, differently person to person. Some people may never feel it towards a certain art piece. Some people may feel an artistic element from art pieces, and some people will experience the sublime. This variation from person to person is part of the subjectivity of art. And so it can be made clear that no artwork will be fully objective. However... There must be criteria upon which people argue about artworks. And these criteria would help narrow down definitions of what makes an artwork versus an art piece. The answer has been sought by many different philosophers, the most notable being Immanuel Kant. Kant's aesthetic philosophy is most famous 
for defining the sublime. That experience of the greatest clashing set of feelings, reason, and sensations that can be had. However, his belief was that the incomprehensible nature of such a clash showed that a person was unfit to actually analyze whatever the art piece was, even though ultimately he thought it good for them to experience because it would develop character. In Kant's view, if a person saw a Jackson Pollock painting and experienced the sublime, then they were inferior to those who did not. The problem with this view is that a person may not comprehend the painting to begin with, let alone experiencing something from it. Everyone knows that a person who enjoys only the biggest blockbuster films, and when they're shown a more artistic movie, they do not understand the themes behind them. Kant would say that this person was actually fritter to critique the artistic movie than the person who experienced the sublime, a reasoning that does not add up. A better answer comes from Martin Heidegger, a German philosopher of the 20th century. He understood that all of art is part of a community's shared understanding of the realities of the world. I'd go so far as to say humanity's understanding of its own existence. In fact, to Heidegger, art pieces could only transition to being artwork if it was continually engaging with the surrounding community in a way that reflected its purpose. If it ever stopped engaging with the community using its purpose, then it would no longer be an artwork, but instead would transition back to being an art piece. An example would be Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, Originally created in the Santa Maria delle Grazie, its purpose was to help facilitate religious experience. As culture changed and the region secularized, its purpose would no longer facilitate religious experience in society and progress from being an artwork to an art piece. Furthermore, Heidegger believed an artwork would have to resist rationalization. Much like Kant's incomprehensible nature of the sublime, Heidegger understood that an artwork could not have simplistic themes, but instead must be something upon which only experience could truly mediate the material, or pardon me, meditate the material, not mediate. For example, the horror and dread in H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, please finance Guillermo del Toro's um, movie, please, please, uh, the dread in H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness is apparent when reading the novella, but if a person was to hear a summary secondhand that summed up the main themes and ideas, they would not fully experience Lovecraft's work and thus not be able to experience the sublime. It was here that Heidegger contended that there was a conundrum. Once an artwork is fully understood by a person, it no longer resists rationalization and reverts to an art piece to that person. Thus, artwork can only exist so long as the sublime has been experienced by a person and that person has not yet rationally worked through that experience. So where does that leave society in relation to art? Well, just because the criteria for an art piece and artworks are objective does not mean that the audience opinions will also be objective. As seen, there are two places where the audience might differ amongst themselves on how good or bad an art piece is. First, the sublime experience can differ between each individual. So people will argue whether the art piece actually transcended to an artwork based on their experience or lack thereof. The sublime. Second, there can be arguments for how well an art piece fit the objective criteria. For example, did the piece properly fit its medium? Example, Cloverfield's editing was so bad I couldn't even tell what was going on. By the way, I disagree. I love fucking Cloverfield. Did the artist's intention become clear or did it not show in the audience interpretation of the art piece? Example, Hotel California is supposed to be about drugs, but instead all I can think of is an actual hotel. Subjective opinions about objective criteria can exist and it is here that the majority of people argue how well art conveys. It, its experiences. So you are safe for now, art majors. Art may not be fully subjective, but that doesn't mean there can't be good or bad art. The real question still exists. Is a particular piece 
good or bad. Now, people can argue either way. Just don't fall into the trap of saying, it's whatever you want it to be. And then the author of this article says, what do you think? Again, this was written in 2016. It was published March 8th, 2016 at the-artifice.com by the Raptor Fence. So the Raptor Fence, I don't know who you are, but you were described as a philosophy graduate from California with a love of the arts, cycling, and kittens. And he's definitely afraid of velociraptors. Now, for me, I do believe in the objective objectivity of art. Um, it's just a question of whether or not the individual person either knows enough or is smart enough. And this isn't a this isn't a look. I'll, I'll give you an example. If you've watched this show for any length of time, you know that I have a particular love of Michelangelo Antonioni, the filmmaker, specifically. I love his Ennui trilogy, La Notte, La Ventura, and The Eclipse. I can't recommend these movies to most of my audience, and this is not a slam on you guys. I just know you wouldn't like them. I, 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 as a matter of fact, a lot of the neorealist or, or the stuff that was coming out of France and Italy in the 50s and 60s there's a lot of that stuff. Like, I love the movie last year at Marion Bad. I love it. I would not recommend it to most people because I don't think, based on most people's experiences with movies, that they would enjoy last year at Marion Bad or even my beloved Wings of Desire. There's a lot of movies I just think that most people wouldn't dig. I think they're great movies, and I think they're objectively great movies. But if you, you, like everything else, you have to be trained to recognize things. And, and unless you have learned about them when you're growing up, you won't know that they're there. And, and what I would say is the reason I wanted to read that long thing about Jaws was there were things in that t Twitter thread, that X thread, that I'd never thought about. And it was a movie I'd seen a hundred times. And when I read that thread, it made me appreciate the movie even more and what Carl Gottlieb had done and what John Milius had done and what Robert Shaw had done in the writing of that script. It made me like the movie more because I learned a perspective about uh, art that I had never considered, even though I'd seen the movie a hundred times. So, is Jaws a great movie? Some people would say, well, Rob, the shark's fake. And I would say, well, okay, but but that does, does that take away from the objectively greatness of that film or not? I don't know. See, I think that that's where the opinion of the individual falls down, but somebody would tell me, but Rob, it just never worked for me. I just didn't like the way the shark looked. It always looked fake, so I, can never, I never bought into the threat. Well, that's, that's a, a very valid criticism. And I would never say that that person is wrong because it, they're not wrong. I mean, if they didn't buy into and there's a reason why, because especially if that person went back and saw Jaws post, sp speaking of Spielberg and, and, and the raptor fence, post Jurassic Park, where the depiction of animals like that are, are photoreal dinosaurs and they could have had a photoreal shark. But when they made the film, that wasn't the case. When I watch Jaws, I don't see a fake shark. I see a shark. I believe the movie utterly. And yes, at the end, when the shark maybe is going like this, I can. it betrays the fact that it's a mechanical shark, and I intellectually know it's a mechanical shark, but following the story, I'm so immersed in it that to me, I don't see that as a drawback, although many people would. And that's where the individual subjectivity comes, in, comes into play. So... Anyway, before I get to my next article, uh, I want to see, I want to like look in and see what um, what you guys are saying. If you have left tips or super chats, let me let me see. So, uh, Tack sends in a tip and says, "I wouldn't say art is fully subjective, but I feel if you're not a fan of a certain genre, you're not equipped to speak on it." I'm not a big horror movie person. It could be the best horror movie ever. And I wouldn't be able to critique it fairly. Um, I would say, okay, that's that's a very mature way to look at it. And I think you're probably right. But on the other hand, 
I think that even genre movies, you don't need to be a genre fan to appreciate a great genre film. Because at their core, they're still, they might be, you know, whatever genre you're working, whether it's horror, science fiction, noir, you know, love story, whatever. I think a great story, depending, doesn't matter what the genre is, an astute viewer can appreciate a great story well told, regardless of genre. But I understand what you're saying, and I, I do appreciate it, because <clears throat> if you don't like horror, if it's not, not your thing, then there are elements of the genre you're not going to recognize, so you might not see how great it is or not. But the overarching story, even though it's a horror story, I think should carry you. I do. Darth Plato says, art is not subjective, but taste is. Fair point. Fair point. Um, But that that is, I mean, taste is also shaped by how much you know about the world. Like for me, when I was a kid, um, and this seems weird to say, but I lived in a world where there was a traveling salesman who came to our door to sell us the World Book Encyclopedia. We didn't have the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was more the upscale version. We got the World Book Encyclopedia, and it was basically given to me. But I put it down in our family room, which later became my TV movie room, uh, and I was proud of it. As a kid, one of my, even though it was it was the family's, it wasn't mine, it wasn't my bedroom, one of my favorite things that we owned was that World Book Encyclopedia. I was constantly in my world book encyclopedia, looking up something, anything, whatever I would find out. It was it was like Wikipedia. For those of you don't know, an encyclopedia. There's encyclopedias online now, but they were actual books that were arranged arranged alphabetically, A to Z. Sometimes you'd have like you know, I and J would have its own volume because there wasn't enough I or enough J to fill up a whole book. But it would be like the Wikipedia. It was just a book full of general knowledge about everything. Kind of like William Atherton's character show on Real Genius. I'm here with, what is, I forget the character's name. What's his doctor's name? I'm here with everything. (laughs) If you guys haven't seen Real Genius, uh, it's in my top five teen films of the 80s. Risky Business being number one. Real Genius floats around though. It's, it's, It's in the top five. It's so good. I think of the immortal words of Socrates who said, I drank what? I love that movie. It's so good. If you guys haven't seen it, it's on 4K. Um, but I agree with you, Darth Plato. The woke crappy I show. Oh, come on. Um, come on. I, I I mean, look, I'm on John's show. I've been I've been streaming with John Campia for eight and a half years. John has been good to me, you know. So I mean, um, so I. You know, I, 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 uh, I, I look at this when I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read your tip because you, you sent me a tip, you supported the channel, but I'm going to read this, but I'm going to say, I'm going to read it in duress. So the woke crappy show says I got cucked out of a hundred K. No, he didn't. Um, he didn't get cucked out of anything. He, he was very honest with it on the channel. You know, uh, an ad agency went belly up that was selling ads and uh, that's a legit thing. It didn't just happen to him. It happened to a lot of people. And my show has been tanking as I like to tell my audience to form their own opinions, but then belittle them when they do. Well, look, I mean, he's a person. Um, is he supposed to sit back and take it? I had to bring back my sloppy seconds. Um, so that's what you're saying. You had to bring back me. I'm John's sloppy seconds. Uh, no. Um that's right. He's back as a diversity hire to appease the academy. I don't know what that means, but I read that, and I, you're taking a shot at me there. And I, I again, I believe, and if somebody wants to be critical of me, I will read what you're saying. But let me ask you this: What was the point of that? You know, here I'm trying to to do a show talking about objectivity and subjectivity of art, and you want to come in and take a personal shot at me or John? Why? Why do that? I mean, why not write me a letter? And I'll read the letter out. But why during this stream when I'm trying to, I'm trying to do something to bring you a show of value? You know? And yet, why this? You know? And I read it. I read what you said. But I, I, I object to it. I object to it because I feel that um, 
in the middle of I'm sitting here trying to do a show. And what, it's like heckling a comedian or you're throwing something at me on stage, which is fine. You, you know, you can do that. I believe in that. The question is why? What did you hope to accomplish? Derail tonight's show? Derail the fact that I've been streaming with John Campia since April of 2015. I think we've done thousands of shows together. And for the most part, I think we've provided some good entertainment and done some good industry analysis. Now, I get it. You might not like me and you might not like John, which is fine. You don't have to like us. But why? Why? And you know what? But I will say this. I appreciate that you sent me a tip and you supported the show. So even though what you said is disparaging to both me and John, I believe that if you're going, if I have a tip feature open, you deserve to be heard. And uh, that's what this show is about. I just think that it would have been, I would have been much more interested to hear what you would have said about the topic. But I get it. It's cool. I will appreciate, Woke, that you did support this channel. So thank you for that. Uh, Scott Bartholomew says, Robert Mapplethorpe's Piss Christ was not art. It was an event to instigate a reaction in the masses. That is very true, but I would, you know, I would ask you, um, uh, that isn't that the definition of what art is? It might be. I mean, obviously, to me, it it was a cheap shot, and I think that, um. You know, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I'm fascinated by religion and the power of belief and all of that. And I've loved movies that have religious themes in them. And it seemed to me like I remember when Piss Christ was a thing, like I remember reading about it, like the L.A. Weekly in like 1990 or something. And I I understand that. But but and I understand that that people's religious beliefs might be an easy, low hanging fruit for people. And but I, I think that why? Why go after people for those kinds of beliefs? And I know other people would say, well, you know, there's been the worst, the worst violence and horror has been visited upon humanity because of religion. I agree. <laughs> I'm not a very religious person. I don't think, I mean, this, this, this country was uh, founded on the principle of separation of church and state. Um, and it certainly was founded to practice your religion, of course. But religion doesn't belong when you're dealing and people, I get it. It's, I don't want to open that can of worms and it's a long debate and I've, I, I don't want to do that. But since you brought up piss Christ and Scott goes on to say TOS as art is intentional and rational. Well, I would say that I would say that, look, my whole thing about, um, the people that were writing the original series were novelists, short story writers, playwrights, and what they wrote was very intentional and the the forms, the storytelling forms that they were dealing with were, were very, I think, classical, all the way back to the Greeks and the Romans. Um, the Star Trek that we're getting today is a product of people who just grew up watching television. They don't have a classical background because they're not applying it. And if they do, they're certainly not applying it to their storytelling. And they're writing what I would say are generic stories, even their humor with Spock, um, is not elevated. It's generic. It's generic humor um, that I find distressing. Um, and I don't like it. <laughs> Mike Alito says, my brain hurts. <laughs> well, I don't want to hurt your brain. Um, I just want to, I just, my, my desire for this, this line of reasoning was just to start a uh, an interesting conversation. Our friend Chemist, who's been around the channel a lot these days, um, sensation is unorganized stimulus. Perception is organized sensation. Conception is organized perception. And science is organized knowledge. Wisdom is organized life. And that's from Kant. Um, I love that. Yes, um, I would say so. But you know, it, it's uh, again. I, I think the the when we think about all this, I mean, we're talking about whether art is subjective and objective. I'm also very aware of the fact that these kinds of contemplations are luxury. Once we're fed and we are 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 under shelter and safe from the environment, then we can start contemplating these big questions. I do understand that these thought experiments are a luxury. 
to live we live in a world where we can even contemplate these things and I'm happy to live here um, but I do think that the quality of art is it comes out of people's consideration of what kind of art they're making why they're why they're making it and I do think it's important to have the underlying philosophical the underpinnings to understand the foundational like I don't understand how anybody can want to work in the science fiction genre without a understanding of science fiction literature or at least have read the 25 great works of science fiction whatever those may be and how do you define them well i bet there's if you got 10 lists you'd probably find the same 10 books out of 25 on those 10 lists you know dune stranger in a strange land you know maybe hyperion fall of hyperion or there's uh, whether whatever Ray Bradbury, the Illustrated Man, probably the Martian Chronicles. You know, there's the Foundation trilogy. There, there's there's a reason why these books are the canon of science fiction. And I think if you want to work in science fiction, you have to have read it. You have to have a working knowledge. And as I said before, modern Star Trek has no science fiction in it. I am not convinced that anybody working on Star Trek: Strange New Worlds or Discovery has any working knowledge of the science fiction genre. Uh, except Kirsten Beyer, who wrote Voyager novels. But for the most part, the writing staff, uh, I don't see a whole heck of a lot of science fiction or understanding of it as a genre. Uh, Joe Panora says, I got to see 28 Days Later in the UK. My father's not into horror, but he really enjoyed it. Do you like that film? I'm holding out for 28 months later. I like both. I think 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks Later are both great, great, great films. Um, really, really, really good. Right up there with the best of these zombie movies, even though it's not like zombies. They're a, a form of zombie. So I'm a huge fan. Huge, huge, huge fan of both films. Joe Panora says, Real Genius, a moral imperative. It is a moral imperative. There's so many good lines in that movie. Chris Knight, man, so many good lines. Secular Monk says, Spielberg relies on the threat of the shark. It's brilliant. I like John Campy. I just wish he would give physical media a chance. Um, you know, I look, I understand. Uh, uh, physical media, remember, physical media is almost half a century old. It, 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 it Actually, to be fair, it pretty much is a half century old. And, you know, if you were never a big physical media collector when you were younger or whatever, it's not something you're going to adopt later in life. Um, and I understand that. I mean, collecting anything is also uh, you have to be a particular kind of person to want to collect things in the first place. Um, and I get that. You know, my grandmother was not a collector. My grandfather was a collector. My grandmother, and I'm a collector too, and my grandmother, she, I remember when she walked into my bedroom and, and, and she was wealthy. She was a wealthy woman. And, um, you know, she said, you know, she said flat out said, I don't think money should be used to collect things. And, and she did collect art and stuff, but um, she said, I, I think money should be used to experience things. And she was a big proponent of travel and going places and doing things and having experiences. And like, she would take me to the theater. Like, I saw a lot of the traveling companies of Broadway shows, but she would get like the best tickets. She took me once. Um, I told her after seeing Clockwork Orange when I was 13, I told her that I really wanted to see Beethoven's Ninth performed by a live symphony and she got me tickets we saw um beethoven's ninth symphony with a 157 piece choral section it was fucking amazing and my grandmother always got the best tickets you know like she was on the boards of all these things and she was transplant new york to seattle so she knew a lot of people and um she was right you know when i went i i got to see like les mis i saw les mis here um, with, with my grandfather and my grandmother, I mean, she would, we'd go to, you know, we went to Chasen's, then we went to Sock Lake's. Boy, I miss my grandmother and grandfather. <laughs> but yeah, we would, we would see it all. Um, uh, Genghis Khani says, hi, Rob, hair's looking good, my friend. Movie night soon. Genghis Khani, you know it. Come on over and watch. We're going to watch a little Rosemary's Baby. You got to be in the movie room. It's, uh, it's pretty fun. Although I think I need to add a subwoofer and a center surround. Um, Scott Bartholomew says, correction, Piss Christ was by Andreas Serrano. Well, there you go. 
There you go. Uh, so, Connie, come on by. Uh, Tom Jr. I didn't. So, Piss Christ, thanks for the correction, Scott. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, rewatched Gotcha today. I love that picture. I love Gotcha. Anthony Edwards starring in a movie. Um, you got to love that. Now, I have another article I, wa- I want to read. Um, and it's, uh, this one is also about art. And um, it comes from Patheos, patheos.com. Um, and this is more of an academic article. But let's just jump into it. Uh, this was written April 6, 2023 by L.J. Uh, Carreri. And this is about objective criteria in art. The world of art is vast and varied, encompassing countless forms of expression across different cultures and time periods. While the subjective aspects of art are often highlighted, the objective principles that underpin many artistic creations are equally important in shaping our understanding and appreciation of art. On the concept of objectivity in art, let's focus here on the universal principles, formal elements, and historical context that contribute to the creation analysis and appreciation of artistic works. The objective principles of art, the golden ratio and proportion. One of the key objective principles of art is the concept of proportion, which is often linked to the golden ratio. This mathematical principle has been used by artists and architects throughout history to create aesthetically pleasing and harmonious compositions. The golden ratio can be found in numerous works of art, from the Parthenon and the Pyramids of Egypt to Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper and Salvador Dali's The Sacrament of the Last Supper. Suffer, the last suffer, the last supper, Freudian slip wraps. Another objective principle of art is the concept of balance and symmetry. Balance refers to the equal distribution of visual weight within a composition, while symmetry refers to the mirroring of forms and shapes along a central axis. These principles contribute to the overall sense of harmony and order in a work of art, making it more visually appealing and engaging for the viewer. Formal elements of art, line, line, shape, color, and texture. The formal elements of art, line, shape, color, and texture, serve as the building blocks for artistic creations. Films, same thing. Uh, These objective components can be analyzed and discussed independently of the artist's intentions or the viewer's subjective experience, providing a solid foundation for evaluating the quality of a work of art. Composition and space. Composition and space are additional formal elements that can be objectively assessed in a work of art. The arrangement of visual elements within a composition and the use of space, both positive and negative, contribute to the overall effectiveness of an artwork, influencing the viewer's experience and engagement with the piece. Uh, The historical context in which a work of art is created plays a significant role in its objective evaluation. Understanding the art movements and styles that influence an artist's work allows for a more informed analysis of the piece, revealing insights into the artist's intentions, techniques, and influences. The societal impact of an artwork is another objective criteria that can be examined to understand its significance. By considering the ways in which a piece has shaped or been shaped by society, we can gain a deeper understanding of its cultural importance and relevance, both in its time and in the present day. While the subjective aspects of art are crucial in shaping our personal experiences and connections with artistic works, the objective principles and criteria of art are equally important in our understanding and appreciation of art. By examining the objective components of art, such as the formal elements, universal principles, and historical context, we can develop a more informed and well-rounded perspective on the vast and diverse world of artistic expression. As we continue to engage with art, let us remember to value both the objective and the subjective aspects of this powerful and enduring form of human expression. Now, you know, that's not the most insightful bit, but I just wanted to talk about the fact that there's some kind of structure and formalism that I think is comes out of our consciousness that we might not even be aware of. And one of those things is, go back to Beethoven, musical composition. Like, I've always said that for whatever reason, rock and roll, right? You hear a great guitar riff, like, for instance, Prince's opening of When Doves Cry, or the beginning of Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, 
Or when Robert Plant screams, hey, hey, mama. We all, it stirs something in us. We feel something. You can't not be moved by the great rock and roll openings of all time. Um, we all know what they are. And, and immediately something comes at you. And you go, it, it, it kicks you into high gear or makes you smile or something. There is a reaction. There's a reason why. Now, we might not know, but I would, I would dare say it's something to do with consciousness, sound. Also, there are things like, for instance, classical composition. Maybe some of the great class, classical composers, whatever your favorite is. They were working in, in mediums, not just music, but there was music has mathematics in it. And they might not have quantifiably been able to tell you or understood how math was related to how a symphony is structured, but it's certainly there. But I think that those composers, because of what they heard and what they heard deep inside of them physically, mentally, and spiritually, they were creating something that was a result of whatever the collective human experience was. I know this is hippy-dippy, esoteric, but I do think it's true. And it, it'll go back to consciousness and it'll go back to our perception of time and the fact it, it all hap, has to do with how human beings, how we're situated in the world. I mean, we don't even see the full spectrum of light. So it, it's what is art? How do we perceive it? I think there's as much a component of it that we don't understand. We're channeling it and it, 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 it it's legitimate. And I do think it's objectively I mean, whether call it music, call it math, what you want, I do think we're tapping in the great the great works of 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 composition and the great works of art. The artists are tapping into something that is universal, that is beyond us. I know, hippy dippy, but it also has to do with perception. And someday it's going to be measurable. I really believe that. I honestly believe that that's the truth. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I do believe that it is in fact. Uh, the truth. Um, Scott Bartholomew says, my favorite story from the illustrated man is the man. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. You make me want to go back and rewatch the movie, which I never thought was very good. Um, but if you haven't read the illustrated man or you haven't read the Martian Chronicles or Dandelion Wine or the October Country, dig into some Bradbury. It, the fall is a great time to do it. So check it out. Now I have a letter. Uh, speaking about art and objectivity and subjectivity, I have a letter from Tomislav. Uh, Tomislav has written a letter, and the subject headline is Zack Snyder and Hope. This is appropriate if you haven't seen Zack Snyder's uh, trailer for Rebel Moon. And it's funny, people are coming back. Yes, does it look like an amalgamation of Dune and Star Wars? Of course, by design. Uh, that it was a Star Wars project Zack Snyder had pitched. And I'm like, somebody came to me and said, well, it just looks like Rob. I, I think it really just looks like a, it looks like a, a remake of Battle Beyond the Stars. And I, I'm like, um, is that a bad thing? Like, who doesn't love Battle Beyond the Stars? Look at, it's St. X-Men of the Valkyrie. Uh, live fast, fight free, and have a beautiful ending. Um, who doesn't like Battle Beyond the Stars? Somebody's like, well, it's based on the Seven Samurai. I'm like, well, it's once removed. It's based really on the Magnificent Seven. But whatever. I, I look at Rebel Moon and I'm thinking the, the sci-fi minded kid in me is like, yeah, man, bring it on. I don't care if it's derivative. I'm going to fucking watch the hell out of that shit. I hope it's in a theater because I want to see it. I mean, Anthony Topkins talking about the prophecies and the children and the whatever. I'm, I'm in. Count me in. Why not? Uh, this one again, the letter. Zack Snyder and Hope coming to us from Tomislav. Hello, Robert. I love your shows and your input. You inspired me to pursue my passion in filmmaking. You're probably better than all of my professors at film school. Well, thank you. I don't know about that, but thank you. Thank you so much for all of your free lessons. The internet and the world is a much better place with you in it. If I could, I would like to write a little paragraph about Zack Snyder. Well, you can, and it's good that you're writing it, and I'm reading it today because the trailer for Rebel Moon dropped. Recently on a Midnight Musings, you were talking about how Zack Snyder's DC trilogy lacked a real-world feel. I was so baffled by that statement, which prompted my letter. For an example, you stated that there were no scenes with Clark and Lois just being journalists. 
Well, except there were a lot, and not just scenes where they were investigating, but scenes that had emotional and human nature. Clark going to Gotham, visiting the building where a criminal lived, interviewing his neighbors and their impression of Batman. Most of them were glad he was there protecting them. While on the other side, when he was interviewing his wife, she was devastated what Batman did. She knew that her husband was a criminal, but he was also a father, and one man should not be the arbiter of justice. You can see how devastated Clark was by her telling that story, holding her baby. It was beautiful and emotional. It was a great scene which builds conflict in Clark. Sometimes I feel like you don't see the humanity and hope in these movies. You seem blinded by Zack's visuals, and while they're great, they're not the reason people fall in love with his movies. I challenge you to find a more human scene in any superhero movie than the scene with Clark and his mother in Man of Steel. Clark returns home, telling his mother how he found his parents, his people. She starts smiling and being so happy for him and at the same time has a fear of losing him. She tells him how she would sleep next to his crib when he was a baby, how he had difficulty breathing, how afraid she was that someone would come and take him away, saying to him how the truth about him is so beautiful, and she breaks down a little. Clark hugs her with tears in his eyes also and a big smile. You could feel so much love and hope in that scene. It made me fall in love with superhero movies again. Just a simple scene of Clark hugging his mother at the porch of their house. Zack made this alien god feel so human. It made me cry, and that is the reason his movies connect with people. The fact that he made us see ourselves in these mythological figures. P.S. Is there a chance of a Midnight Metal return with Dave Parker? To me, it was your best show. You guys had great chemistry, and Dave had great knowledge. Also, he wasn't afraid to start a debate. <laughs> with love, Thomas Lav. Well, Thomas... First of all, thank you for writing that great letter. Now, here's the thing. I just want to be clear. Like, first of all, I've been a Man of Steel supporter since I first saw it. What I was trying to convey is that Zack Snyder's movies are set in mythological land, mythological world. They're not set in our world. It, nothing looks like our world. And when I was talking about normal scenes, I would say... If you go back and you look at Superman the movie, Richard Donner's Superman the movie, when you get to New York City, they're in New York City. You know, they're shooting in the city. They're not against these beautiful painted backdrops. I mean, Zack Snyder's movies are opera. They're myth. They're myth-making. And everything, nobody's like, hey, man, how's it going, dude? There's no conversations like that. Everything, you know, everything is operatic. It's all heightened. It's all big. And while I do love that stuff, I think that one of the reasons that those movies do not connect with a lot of people is the idea of the pantheon of gods. And let's face it, the DC characters are gods. Even Batman, who's a mortal man, is still a demigod at least. So we're, you're talking about myth-making as opposed to the everyday. There's no such thing as the everyday in a Zack Snyder movie. And I know you can watch people go to work and everything, but... But nobody's having casual conversations. Everything in Zack Snyder's world is important. And that's what I mean to say. I like Zack Snyder's operatic films. I do. Um, although I think that sometimes he uses opera and forgets the substance. But I'm a huge Man of Steel fan. I just want, want you to know that. Um, but anyway, great letter, and um, thank you for writing in. And again, if you want to write me a letter, write down there, postgeeksingularity.com, and uh, send them to me. Um, Darth Plato says, <laughs> uh, Darth Plato says, Rebel, the Rebel Moon trailer reminded me of the Golden Child. I, 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 I got the knife. Um, I love The Golden Child. <laughs> uh, it's not great. Uh, Charles Dance is great in it. <laughs> Tywin Lannister, but the um, the movie is yeah, it's not. It's not great. I don't know if it reminded me of that, but it's <laughs> you're not wrong, Darth Plato. <laughs> wow. Um, Dan Candy says, Rob, who wins, Sador and his stellar converter, or Tarkin and his Death Star? Oh, come on, dude. 
Tarkin would win as much as I love John Saxon. Uh, and you know what? If you guys haven't seen Battle Beyond the Stars, it's pretty good. John Saxon plays Sador. Sador of the Malmori? <laughs> you got John Sales wrote that script. If you haven't seen Battle Beyond the Stars, James Horner did the music. George Papard plays Cowboy. Robert Vaughn plays Gelt. Uh, John Boy Walton plays Shad. Darlene Flugel, who's in, by the way, To Live and Die in L.A. Or, uh, I mean, come on. She plays the love interest. And, okay, next time you watch Battle Beyond the Stars, everyone's like, it's look, the starship has boobs. That's true. But if you look at it from the top down, it's the it's it's a female... The main hero starship in Battle Beyond the Stars is the female reproductive system with the ovaries and the womb and all that. Cheeky bastards. You go, James Cameron, who worked on the effects. So, um, but Tarkin, the Death Star is going to take out Sador. I'm sorry. They are. Uh, Scott, Bar- Scott Bartholomew says, all DC movies are myth-making compared to the MCU. Well, I mean, yeah, the MCU is much more grounded and, and because the characters are more grounded. But it doesn't make one better than the other, just different. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings, I guess this is the end of this show. Uh, I just wanted to talk about objectivity versus subjectivity of art because people are always saying it's subjective and I don't believe that's true I believe that there are universal truths whether we can perceive them or not but they're out there and we'll find them we just don't have any way to quantify them yet but our technology I would imagine that we will be able to you know sometime in the future Um, again it's frustrating a lot of the time to argue like I don't believe everybody's opinions are equal because there's people that are educated that when they're like if somebody's talking to me about economic theory I don't know fuck all about economic theory I can listen to them but my opinions are not as valid as an economist's they're just not no matter what and I have no problem admitting that because it's true you know um but it's interesting like when I talk about Star Trek a lot and I get thrown, it gets thrown back in my face that I don't understand it. Or I'm like, no, I do. I do. And I don't, you know, I, I, I resist. It's like when people criticize, you just, you just got to listen. You can't fight back because fighting back, you lose, you'll never win. So anyway, um, (laughs) Joe Panora says, if in rebel moon, Eddie Murphy says, my brother's numpsy, I'm in. Come on, my brother Numpsy. No. <laughs> um, uh, that's funny, though. Uh, Joe, yeah. And on that note, first of all, I want to thank everybody for supporting the channel via Super Chats and Tips. I appreciate that. Uh, and memberships. We're going to have a member call this weekend. And uh, things are things are percolating on the channel. A lot of good stuff's coming up, which is good. I know I keep saying that, but it really is. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's till Tuesday, Voices Carry. And on that note, I want to thank my great moderator, Tom Jr. Jackson. I do not know um, uh, who else is here because I haven't really looked. I, I would assume Tom Jr. Jackson's here. He is, but he's the man. Um, Scott Bartholomew says, bring on 10 and 20. You will. You'll get that. Um, but yeah, I most want to thank all of you for continuing to be one of the greatest audiences on YouTube. Um, I love the healthy back and forth and I love everyone's opinions and I read all the comments. So send them to me. And if I don't answer a comment, it doesn't mean that I dislike your comment. Sometimes I just like the comments to exist on their own. Now I am going to go watch Ahsoka so I can talk about it. I will be on the John Campia show podcast tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so thank you. And on that note, remember every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear and all you have to do is listen and with that i say to all of you have a better night